Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time at the Apollo, David Sedaris. The man on stage playing to a standing room only crowd at New York's fabled Apollo Theater is not a rock star. But don't tell that to his fans. He's just so funny. It's just amazing. I don't know, the way he looks at the world and that quirky stuff, it's, it's, it's great. Thank you very much for coming. He's a writer by the name of David Sedaris. A writer who still can't quite believe his good fortune, despite nine million book sales that say, believe it. At last night's signing, I was approached by a teenage girl who asked me to autograph what was, without question, the ugliest t-shirt I had ever seen in my life. It was painted by a dolphin, the girl explained. I must have looked like that wasn't quite strange enough for me. A dolphin with scoliosis, the girl's mother added. The fact that I could like make a career out of reading, like I never allowed myself to dream that that would happen. And do you like to listen to him or do you like to read Both. it yourself? Both. I've listened and read and I wish you were my best friend. <laughs> Okay, and I have a joke for you. Please. His devoted readers often wait for hours for a chance to share a story or a joke. Why don't lobsters like to share? Why? Because they're Why shellfish. <laughs> With the guy who's been called the prime candidate for funniest writer alive. <laughs> he never complains that the lines are too long. I love getting attention. I just, lo like a child loves it. And it's never worn right. off. And so when people say, oh, the book signings go on, oh, that must be awful. It's like, what part of people standing in line for 10 hours to say how much they love you is bad to you? Like, <laughs> David Sedaris was born in upstate New York, but grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, the second of six children, all of whom, along with his mother, Sharon, and father, Lou, figure prominently in his stories. My father called me into his den and told me to get out. And I felt as though he was firing me from the job of being his son. The quest for attention and the love of storytelling, he says, began around the family table. All we ever wanted was to make our mother laugh. And she was generous with her laughter. She wasn't a fool, though. And she would say, that went on way too long, or <laughs> I've heard that before. And even at the time, I remember thinking, I think this is different. I think this is different than other people's lives. Who wants to go to a cockfight? Which may help explain why younger sister Amy Sedaris also found fame with her quick wit and comic timing. But if I don't graduate by the time I'm 50, I'll be the laughing stock of Flat Point High. It was normal, simple, middle class upbringing, and somehow you and Amy got catapulted kind of into the spotlight. But I think just because we were more ambitious, I mean, I, th I think that had anyone else in my family wanted that, then they could have had it as well. If young David Sedaris had high ambitions, he kept it to himself. He dropped out of college twice, did way too many drugs, but somehow held it together with a series of low-paying jobs. For many years, I cleaned apartments in New York, which is not a bad way to make a living. One of those jobs. Hi, Merry Christmas! You guys all have your Christmas wishes right on the top of your head? A Christmas elf at Macy's department store in New York City. I don't have any skills and I'm small, and so they hired me. I wear green velvet knickers, a forest green velvet smock, and a perky stocking cap decorated with spangles. This is my work uniform. Every day, the 30-something Sedaris toiled in the service of Santa, and every night... I would write in my diary all these things that happened. Can you close your eyes and make a very special Christmas wish? Everything these elves said had an exclamation point at the end of it. Then one day, NPR's Ira Glass asked him to read one of his stories on the radio. The rest, as they say... It just changed everything overnight. It was like somebody came along with a wand and said, here you go, here's everything you ever wanted. 
please join me in welcoming the one and only David Sedaris. He's been showered with accolades ever since, even invited to speak to Princeton's graduating class in 2006. I date myself, but back then we were on a pass-fail system. If you passed, you got to live. <laughs> and if you failed, you were burned alive on a pyre that's now the Transgender Studies Building. Going to take a dive? Oh! Today, David Sedaris divides his time between France and England and travels the world gathering material for his quizzical and slyly subversive stories. If animals were more like us, if mice kept pets and toads could cuss. His latest book is a collection of tales about animals. Well, kind of. The squirrel and the chipmunk had been dating for two weeks when they ran out of things to talk about. They just become so human. <laughs> well, I think if they were human, then I think as a listener or as a reader, you would think, I'm like that. I don't want to listen to this story anymore. Too close. But if it's, an, if it's a chipmunk, then you think, oh, that's a story of a chipmunk. And then you're almost near the end and you think, oh, that's me. <laughs> Would you have taken a job here in your early days when you were cleaning houses and working as an elf? No, I, I couldn't have played second fiddle to, to a, a sea lion as gracefully as the people who work here. Because here it's all about the sea lions, right. whereas with me it would have been like, I eat fish too. I eat fish, I just had fish last night. I wrote a story about eating fish that you should really read. Fodder, perhaps, for another story somewhere down the line. Is it fair to say that your life story is a little bit of a fairy tale? Exactly. I mean, it's, if mine isn't, I don't know whose is. Thank you. 